Security Conference. This year is the fifth conference we are holding, and we have a very elaborate list of speakers. My name is Anja Herzl, and I will be your moderator for the upcoming two days. If you got any questions, just let me know. I will be around any time. And after our speakers, we normally have enough time for having questions, having a little talk. That's no problem with microphones for the audience also. Our first speaker is Mr. Alessandro Guarino. He's a senior information security professional and independent researcher. He's the founder and principal consultant of Studio AG, a consultancy firm based in Italy and active since 2000, serving clients both in the private and the public sector and providing cybersecurity, privacy and data protection consulting services. He's also a digital forensics analyst and consultant, as well as expert witness in the court. He holds an MSc in industrial engineering and a BSc in economics. With a f <laughs> well, <laughs> I shall cut it. Okay, that's okay. <laughs> then just the last sentence. As an independent researcher, he delivered presentations at international conferences, including ISSE. He will be talking about the geopolitics of artificial intelligence. Welcome on stage. Thank you very much. It doesn't matter the full beyond. I don't want to bore you at all. I mean, and thank you very much for having me again here in Munich. Uh, can we switch? Yes. Thank you very much. It's always a pleasure to be here and talk here. So. Subject of today is the geopolitics of artificial intelligence, or in other words, how artificial intelligence uh, pertains to power of states and countries. I will not go about the, again about the speaker, it's not a problem. So why are we are talking about this subject at all? I mean, artificial intelligence has come of age right now, even if uh, we are going to see that artificial intelligence has a long history of up and downs and uh, failed promises uh, since the 1950s at least and so on. Uh, but now artificial intelligence or better, it's machine learning we are talking about as we will see uh, because artificial intelligence as I understand it pertains to actual intelligence. So building something that resembles a natural intelligence. While now the term is uh, applied to models and techniques and software that is basically machine learning techniques. Remains to be seen uh, if machine learning is uh, the basis for intelligence, for general intelligence or not. Probably not, uh, but we will, we will see. It's, uh, it's a bit uh, open for debate. But right now, the, the applications, the techniques and the applications are now firmly on the radar of high-level uh, uh, policy makers, even leaders of countries. It is relevant now for all sources of power because what is geopolitics at the end of the day? Geopolitics is how power is distributed among countries and how they relate to one another, how they use it, how they can uh, uh, decide to influence other actors, other countries or non-state actors as well. So it is proven by the fact that we have seen almost 20 national uh, artificial intelligence strategies published in only the, in the last two years. Uh, the last uh, official act of the leader in the artificial intelligence field is dated Gen uh, February 11th, so a few days ago, with the executive order by the President of the United States of America. So we are in the midst of a really, really important uh, concern about AI by, 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 by leaders and countries. Uh, in general, artificial intelligence work is developed in three di different environments, as we have seen. Research in academia, the corporate research and development uh, um, offices and structures like Google, for instance, and the military. So we have two of them that are relatively open, not completely open, but uh, relatively open and uh, who share results and data sets with the outside world. The third one, not so much, obviously. The military applications are usually not, uh, not open to the public, even, even if uh, some research groups, one of them uh, which I am a, a, a part of, funded by NATO, has open 
open results for the public, so not unclassified. The interest for AI is part of this general uh, resurgence of the nation state we have seen in these few years. So <clears throat> the concept itself of uh, a global world, a global internet, an open internet is right now, I don't want to see basically and uh, essentially dead, but uh, it is in a very bad shape. Each state is trying to reclaim its own borders in cyberspace, including using AI techniques. And there is, of course, this general momentum towards security, security, security everywhere. We live in a world of uh, national security paranoia. And AI is seen as one of the tools to secure the state right now as well. So I like these slides, I use it often, and uh, it's, it, it shows that uh, artificial intelligence from the beginning has already have a, a really bumpy story of uh, great expectations, fail to deliver, then great expectations again, and so on, for at least 70 years. Right now, it seems that uh, AI is really come, uh, come of age, or, or uh, machine learning techniques at least, because we have a huge uh, availability of data, we have huge availability of computing power, flexible computing power uh, in the cloud, we have the development of several algorithms that are now mature, etc. But still, is that only machine learning or actual artificial intelligence. The reality is that basically what we label under artificial intelligence is only machine learning techniques. They are powerful anyway. The problem with that in general from a yeah, theoretical perspective is that uh, they are usually domain specific and task specific. Geopolitics. Why geopolitics? Geopolitics is back online again. We have electricity and duct tape is solving everything. So, welcome back on stage. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. I will try not to tempt luck too much. Okay, as we say, so motivation. Going back to the origins, uh, why why we're talking about geopolitics of AI? Because uh, geopolitics is about relative absolute that that thing over there, and uh, nowadays. That thing over there comes from data. Whoever controls the data have more, yeah? We understand what. <laughs> Making sense of data, using it to influence others, uh, persons, country, the public opinion in different countries is key to that thing. And that thing can be leveraged much, much better with machine learning techniques and, uh, and uh, uh, algorithms. So, we have a state now where technology and ICT has become so complex and uh, in many ways so hard to, to design and develop that, that there is a danger that it, it has become an enabler of the state and not of the individual anymore. Again, I'm sorry to say that, and this is a, uh, a line of uh, thinking and slash research that I started and even in my speech here at the, at the conference a couple of years back, there is a resurgence of the state and uh, AI is only a part of that. So AI influences military power, it influences also economic power, which is another big element. And economic powers, for instance, where AI can help a developed country, a developed state, are smart cities, efficiency in working, uh, Consumer profiling as a competitive advantage of the big companies of country A and maybe not of country B, US and China, so to speak. Uh, a better demographics. AI impacts everything, including the health sector. So improved diagnosis, improved quality of life, improved productivity, improved length of the life can help a country have a better demographic, a better power force, a, a better, a, a more efficient power force, a workforce and so more power overall. Just to reinforce the concept that we are talking about politics and not about techie, the techie word, the executive order of President Trump 
February 11th, a few years this week, basically. And uh, the speech of the president of China, of the People's Republics of China, she at the Communist Conference, uh, Communist Party Congress, a few years back. We'll see the details later on. In particular, about military power. So, there is many ways in which artificial intelligence can improve and make the military power even more asymmetrical than it already is. For instance, if we limit ourselves to scenario and challenges in when to resort to force. This is one of the most critical part of how military work and how they make decisions. So when, when to use the military at all. And uh, machine learning can and will be even more in the near future used to that, to that extent, three, three, three scenarios and challenges, for instance. One, machine learning using in support of the decision itself uh, of resorting to force. It pertains to better intelligence, better use of the intelligence. Predictive models are already used in intelligence work, and they will be used even more in the near future. So whoever has the better models, the better developed the techniques, will have a sheer advantage on it. This can lead not only to information of the human decision makers, but also to automatic self-defense. Automatic defense, not only cyber. And that can raise all sorts of problems, of course. Um, there are work done uh, on predictive models that are and will be able to say that an adversary is uh, near an attack or a use of force. So this poses a bit of a problem. When there, it is an automated system that decides if an attack is imminent, theoretically I can use self-defense, but the decision is based on an automatic process. Is that okay with international law? when it is the right moment to employ such a decision making. These are open challenges. Uh, from the point of view of sheer realist politics and, uh, and uh, statecraft, having these instruments is too tempting not to use them. And the doctrine, especially of the United States, uh, as we have seen uh, since the beginning of this century, has been for immediate reaction or even preventive, preventive attack when they suspect there is a possibility of uh, the use of force by hostile actors. The using, using uh, automated processes would be even more controversial because uh, uh, the decision will be more rapid, one. And third point, we don't see many transparency in how machine learning techniques work as of now. Most of the machine learning uh, algorithms, techniques, etc., work at, as black boxes. So, data in, decision out. The inner workings uh, are not very uh, accountable as of now. This, uh, this is a problem also, for instance, in the civilian world for uh, automatic profiling uh, regarding the GDPR and how we treat data and process data. Since we have to be accountable, it's very hard to do that using machine learning, or at least the current machine learning techniques. Beside the actual use of force, of military force, another point where power is being deployed is A-powered information warfare. We all know the talks about influencing uh, election processes by some countries in other countries, but using AI in the near future, or possibly even now, we are not sure about that because this is, uh, this is the realm of the covert, of course, but uh, machine learning techniques can use to inject, create and inject false communications, synthetically created. This can be done at a tactical level to forge orders to units, for instance, or uh, single soldiers, or even to the strategical influencing uh, public opinion or key policy makers. This, uh, this is something very powerful because 
Information is power not only in uh, how to make systems work, but how to make people work and take decisions. If those people are in charge of military units, that can be very, very critical. And uh, the effectiveness, this is not only sci-fi. A, a, a few days back, we have uh, read the news about um, uh, a new research having been done by OpenAI, which is the a AI think tank uh, financed, among others, by Elon Musk, etc., in the US, which, as the name says, uh, they usually publish all their research publicly. Uh, in this case, they decided not to publish their, their results about a new text generator they were working on that is able to fake uh, journalistic text news, et cetera, in such a realistic way that they decided not, not, not to publish the results for fear of the consequences. So if that can be done for journalistic uh, information, for articles, et cetera, it can be done for, for military communication as well. So what we are seeing now in terms of the, of the actual countries in, in working on AI, we have two major powers, basically, US and China. They are the absolute leaders in this field. And they are moving not only in this strict AI arena towards competition and rivalry. We've seen trade wars. We've seen, uh, basically, confrontation in so, many, in so many fields in these few years, and especially with these last two, uh, the US administration and China politics which are doing now. Uh, US and China are the, 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 the top tier of AI. No question about it. There are secondary powers like Russia, which has ambitions, but not very, not very foundations to support them. The UK, Israel, France, India, they have all strong AI sectors, but not to be compared with US and China. The trade confrontation we are seeing now in the wider world is just the first case of rivalry. We have many examples. Huawei, ZTE banned last year from doing business with the US, etc. What about Europe? Europe uh, has a lot of problems. Europe as a whole, the European Union, is a totally insignificant geopolitical power, and uh, it is also so in the AI arena as well. Also, there is a lot to be done. Again, from a purely real politics stance, uh, European regulation can also hinder the development of this sector. The general data protection regulation, most of all. Uh, there is a real danger. If you look at that, a danger from the point of view of the development of the sector of artificial intelligence slash data has been used for the optimization of traffic. This is much more complicated than it seems. It seems stupid saying like that, but it is a very advanced application. Special economic zone devoted to artificial intelligence. Uh, source of data, China is very apt on sources of data. They have one company that occupies basically what Facebook, Twitter, and uh, Apple payments and online payments occupy in, uh, in, in the West. Uh, and we have a lot of effort from tech companies on the hardware side. Huawei has uh, labs in the European Union developed here, here in Munich, one of them, and Baidu and Tencent in the US, etc. So, the push for the very top spurred a lot, a lot of activities, and this is part of the strategy of China, where it wants to expand her sphere of influence in two basic. Uh, uh, essential areas, Southeast Asia and Africa. And an example from Africa, in May 2018, CloudWalk uh, builds an AI face recognition system for Zimbabwe, which, as we all know, is not exactly the most democratic country in the world. Uh, and this, is, this, is, this is, can be considered an exemplar of data colonization, you know, where the third world uh, country produces data allows an hegemonic power to use it and leverage it. So the hegemonic power can develop their own models, their own techniques, and the dictatorship of the third world country can help 
butters its power. But the data flows not from the country that produces it, but flows from that country to the hegemonic power, China in this case. It's not so different for the US, even in uh, softer ways, but basically big data is flowing from the sphere of influence of the US, i.e. Europe, to the US to be used and leveraged. So China has a few advantages in the race, access to huge amounts of data, of course, 800 million users of line, lacks privacy protection laws, and also lacks laws about the aggregation of data. And obviously a close connection of tech companies with the state, because there is not an actual private sector in China. Uh, most important thing among those uh, uh, those companies are the, the one uh, listed here, that they are individuated by the government as the AI national team. They are all very famous, maybe apart from iFlyTech, maybe it's the least famous of the five, four, sorry. And they are a facial recognition uh, company. They're especially uh, good at that. What about Russia? Uh, Russia has more words than actual power, actually. That quote from Vladimir Putin is very famous. The one who becomes leader in this sphere will be the ruler of the world. But uh, the self-image of Russia as a superpower in this domain is quite, is quite uh, far from reality. They have a very weak research and development sector. Uh, they have, in general, a poor business environment, even poorer than China. They have an authoritarian state, but much less efficient than, uh, than China's. They have attempted uh, repeatedly to create a special economic zones and uh, artificial Silicon Valleys, quote unquote, with varying uh, degrees of success. And they have a demographic problem and a lack of talents inside Russia. Total contrary of China, where they have strong demographics, young people and very talented. We have a big pool of talent in China. And the human factor is very important in developing power in general and in AI in particular. What about the US? The US is still the leader in the arena. The US uh, is a concept very variegated. I try to summarize it a bit here, but it's much more. They have the government. The government has been engaged in the um, preceding administration with a few reports on AI. They seem not interested in this administration, uh, in, the, in the problem, in the domain, but military pressure, of course, for the complex was very strong. And these yield, yielded results, because as we have said just a few days ago, this week, uh, the, we will see in a second, uh, the administration issued an executive order about maintaining American leadership in artificial intelligence. So the federal government is now engaged in the arena as well. The private sector, as you've seen at the beginning, the three, the three uh, areas, environments in which artificial intelligence was de is developed. The private sector is the strongest in the world, of course. The big uh, giants of the web, so-called, in the Silicon Valley. Uh, but in the private sector, there is a, a strange competition between the, you know, the Silicon Valley ecosystem, which is a theoretical, very theoretical anti-establishment uh, outlook, and uh, the military industrial complex, uh, which is a heritage of uh, decades past, which is composed by quasi-public entities, because they are technically private, but basically they work. The government is their only client, their main client, and their main influencers. Some of those companies have been kept alive in decades past artificially by the government. So they have a very, very strong private sector, and they can basically cover all the bases. U.S. is still the leader, also because of their academic sector is still very strong and they work in synergy. Uh, in the Silicon Valley ecosystem, the academic uh, 
the universities that works very closely with the private sector and they spin off startups and so on. So this is the initiative, February 11th, executive order on maintaining American leadership in artificial intelligence. And first of all, this shows that they are uh, conscious of, fact, of the fact that they are still the leaders and they want to maintain the leadership. Uh, the executive orders has five main points, and we have seen those. So investing in research and development, investing meaning funds from the federal government in that. So buttressing not only the private sector, but also the public, uh, the public research. The unleashing of AU resources, again, through investing and building the workforce, which is very important to maintain leadership. The government wants to set its own governance standards uh, for artificial intelligence, including ethical standards, theoretically, even at least on paper. And the fifth one, artificial, uh, international engagement and protecting the advantage. Uh, at least on paper, the United States wants to engage with the international community, which they don't, uh, usually America doesn't have a history of uh, international engagement in the past, in the real sense, and with this administration even less. So I don't know what, it, what, what was that thing going to bring. That would be interesting to watch at least. Okay, bes beside the, the two leaders, the others, the other countries lag very, very far behind. Even if some of them is trying, uh, France, the president himself, engaged in uh, artificial intelligence in a famous speech in March 2018. The government put on the table a 1.5 billion investment plan, uh, which entails uh, the creation of national research centers, an open data policy, which is very interesting because uh, machine learning models that we have seen need data, and uh, making data open can be seen as a nice thing, but it is instrumental in buttressing uh, how artificial intelligence works. Without data, no machine learning models. Regulatory and financial framework, this is also at the very heart of every state uh, thoughts. They thought about regulation first, but they put, uh, at least in the French way, also ethics regulation as an important point in their strategy, at least on paper. The United Kingdom, again, very strong uh, uh, private sector, just like the US, not very, not very much engagement from the government itself, which probably has other thoughts <laughs> need these, uh, these, these days and years, but uh, we, have, we have seen uh, a sector deal, again, last year, <coughs> which at least on paper sets a comprehensive approach by the government. Again, still betting, betting a lot on uh, investments in the private sector in close connection with the government. And we have seen a report from parliament uh, last year as well with the government response, but uh, yeah, not very heartfelt. <laughs> then we have, for instance, Israel, which is a very different approach, very strong uh, state directed approach to artificial intelligence and security in general. Uh, they are uh, quite secretive about their results, but they are thought to have a, a very strong approach buttressing, you know, state policy. The European Union, the European Union, oh my God, the European Union. The European Union basically, geopolitical, is a non-existent non actor. Uh, what we have seen uh, as of now is uh, still in keep with the traditional approach of the, of the Commission and of the European Union in general, uh, regulation before development. Uh, so they are thinking about uh, what to regulate and how to regulate it before having something to regulate upon. That's my own personal view. Uh, the Commission nominated this uh, high-level expert group on artificial intelligence, uh, but they are more interested in how to stop 
basically the development on how to harness the development uh, <coughs> uh, then to how to develop it. They, are, they have drafted already this uh, document, which is public, Ethics Guidelines for Trustworthy AI. So Europe doesn't have still a strong AI artificial intelligence sector, but they are still thinking, they are already thinking about how to harness and have a trustworthy AI sector. They are focused on ethics, of course, ethics and regulation. Uh, the European Union as such, now the problem is that we have no military, European military to apply and drive the innovation because the, the harsh reality is that the military sector puts money in it and drives innovation. This is what it is in reality in the US, in China and also in other countries. We mentioned Israel, which is a special case, but many countries, uh, when the military wants some innovation in some fields, they usually get it. And also, we don't have militaries and we don't have big technology company to drive innovation or drive research and development. Google or Alibaba or Baidu, whatever they are, we don't have those actors in Europe. So we don't have big actors, whether they are the military or the tech giants that drives and put money in the innovation. We spend a lot of money in the European Union in research and development I'm talking about, for instance, the Horizon uh, projects. I know about that because I, I am involved directly in that, but with poor results, basically, in project. How much? Five minutes? Five minutes, thank you. I will, I, will, I will stay in that. So I don't see how the European Union will be able to compete with those other actors in any way. That's my analysis. I hope to be wrong but as a European, but I don't think I will be. What are the possible scenarios? We, we, we are already seeing a kind of arms race in artificial intelligence. We are we already seeing, we are already being seen a different uh, flow of big data sets from the producer, so the countries that they can generate the data to the hegemonic powers, US and China. Is the only alternative to develop a regulation approach? Uh, that's a question because if we take that, uh, that approach, we could hinder the whole sector and uh, the flow of data. I don't, know, I don't know if that is the right approach. Uh, for Europe, it's not looking good. It, it, is a, a, yeah, it has become commonplace to say that data is the new oil, but it is in more sense than one, like oil, it is not to be uh, exploited by the people that produces it. So if you don't, if the, like we've seen in the example, which is quite extreme of Zimbabwe, for instance, the countries that produces the data uh, will have to turn to the hegemonic powers to extract information and value from it. And this could be, could lead to even more concentration of power. In conclusion, if a Cold War, a rivalry between the US and China is going to develop in artificial intelligence and the tech world as well, that could lead to two different sphere of influence with two different uh, set of companies, two different uh, regulation, and possibly total incompatibility if you don't work, if you don't work together. At the moment, in geopolitical terms, all the other actors are basically irrelevant, strong as they are. I think I stayed in the five minutes and I have at least a few minutes for uh, questions. If anybody is interested in asking them, I would be interested. Thank you very much for your time and for having me here. Again. So, thank you very much for your very interesting you. speech. Due to our little breakdown, we're a little delayed so just a short round of questions so we can proceed with the next speaker are there any questions from the audience nope yep yeah i've heard someone well, yeah i see someone is waving yeah. just a moment come over so please um, sorry, in the just speak just speak okay in the last 10 years china has 
um, had about 600,000 students uh, studying um, worldwide. Last year alone, they had 600,000 studying worldwide. Um, Australia, United Kingdom, and the US are thinking about forbidding Chinese students studying on elite universities. Um, is this um, a huge problem, or how do you think this will develop? Because I think the students make um, uh, win. Yeah, yeah. So the human factor, I mean, the skill pool that you drive upon. Ah, yeah, sorry. The skill pool, the human factor is extremely important to have this strong AI sector. So, yes, this is one of the expressions of the rivalry I was talking about. My own point of view is it's going to be unfortunate if you start to ban students from, such, from one country or another to study abroad, of course. But uh, I think it is, a, it is a possibility. I hope not, uh, but it is a possibility because, uh, yeah, the Americans as well as the others seen, are seeing that as uh, Chinese students abroad as a way to empower China itself. And it is not far from the truth. It, it's true because uh, they are drawing on knowledge from another country. So I hope that's not going to happen, but uh, it is a possibility because it is one of the aspects of this rivalry of this uh, quote-unquote Cold War that is going to develop right now. I see another question. Here you are. You said that uh, GDPR hinders the development of AI, possibly, possibly yes. Uh, I would like to know how you come to this conclusion because I would strongly disagree on that one. Okay, I came to the military or even prevention, like uh, preemptive uh, attack systems. Do you think it's a good idea if uh, multiple like uh, geopolitical players develop the same systems and they start interacting with each other in some way, maybe like stock market or I don't know. You mean something, yeah, a conflict may fought entirely by... Well, we have seen things going bad on the stock market when autom automatic okay. systems start influencing each other and then they go in like spiral. Ah, yeah, okay, okay, so okay. Uh, well, if both parties have those deployed, yes, there is a real possibility that uh, automatic systems start to react to each other. So, we will have to see that. <laughs> I, I don't have the answer and I want to talk about the future and what's going to happen. Uh, right now, it's going to be asymmetrical for a long time. Even if the big players, the US and China, deploy that, it's very, the very possibility is that the attacker doesn't have the capabilities, and at least for a few years. Uh, if the attacker conducts an attack via automated system, so artificial intelligence for offense, and there is an artificial intelligence agent for defense, that could be that could be interesting, <laughs> but yeah, I don't know about the future actually. I don't know what's going to happen. It's different in the stock markets because you have a very confined environment uh, where all the agents are working in, in strict confines and can do a lot of less of things. Okay, so to speak, I don't have the time to go into detail, but uh, it's much easier for them to escalate and exponentially create damage in a much confined space.